Uh, for those of you that came expecting a PhD level dissertation on time relativity, you're going to be immediately disappointed. For the rest of you, disappointment may take a little bit longer and I'll do my best to keep you as engaged as possible for the last time of the day. Particularly since I gave this a very grandiose title under pressure to get a paper submission in and the best I could think of to describe what was in my head at the time was this. Hopefully by the end you'll go, there is some correlation between what the title said and what was actually delivered, but there may be some gaps. But I don't lack for aspiration in this talk. I'd like to encompass pretty much everything, uh, all the way from the Big Bang to the Big Crunch, and to describe how we might create an understanding of time that can be reflected in a computing system that has a little bit more meaning connecting the human idea of time as we think of it and the computing idea of time, which is quite often something a lot different. So this is probably a little bit too big a scale to start on. Let's get down to a little bit narrower and start to put some things on the timeline. So the most obvious thing we might do is to say somewhere in this continuity from Big Bang to Big Crunch is the year 2022. So I think with some confidence we can say this year, if you subscribe to a view of a of a single universe and a single time-space continuum, and I appreciate not everyone may agree with that, so just work with me for the moment on the idea that that's, that's what we do when we model time today. And that 2022 is just a number, could be anything, but we, we call it 2022 as an offset from an epoch, which we define in the Gregorian calendar, at least the proleptic one, as starting from the year one, and in the typical convention of problems we have in computing. We've already struck one of those, the offset problem, or the plus one problem, because there is no year zero, of course, in the current calendar that we use, which makes things a little complicated. But just working with 2022 is not that helpful. If we zoom in a little bit onto the timeline, we can see that 2022 occupies more than just a moment of time, it occupies some space and time. And if we keep zooming in, and you'll get the idea, time itself no longer really appears to look like a moment or an instant, depending upon whether you're an astronomer or not. It starts to look a lot more like an interval. And the idea that came to me, and I have no expectation that this is an original idea whatsoever, is that the many of the problems we encounter in working with time in computing is that we use the idea of time in computing in implementation as a moment or an instant, but in everyday human life, we tend to think of time as a span or an interval. And so if we take that down to a deeper level and think what might that mean in the way that we model time? What kinds of problems could we solve more easily? And of course, on the other side, what areas would this kind of approach not work at all from a computing point of view? So if time we would typically consider in computing as an instant or a moment, then the idea of considering it as an interval would be a somewhat different approach, therefore fulfilling a new way, not new as in absolutely new, oh my God, I've just invented something, new as in applying an existing concept to a practical outcome, which is a lot of what we do with Elixir. And one of the reasons why this starts to fit more comfortably is that we all walk around saying, yeah, I went to ElixirConf 2022. We didn't say 2022 in August 31st at 5 p.m. We say 2022, and everyone is comfortable with that. My birth date is the 3rd of April. You don't need to know the rest. You can tell already that it's, you know, a significant period of time has passed. That's an interval, not a moment. And as a consequence, we start to get the idea that maybe there are some shortcomings in the implementations of time in, in computing because they don't 
adequately model the way humans think about time. So can we do anything about that? Well, we're in a pretty complex situation because if we think just about the time and date types in Elixir, we already have quite a bit of complexity and that complexity is intended to try and reflect the different ways we think about time. But I do sometimes wonder, looking at the conversations in the forum and the Slack, that maybe this actually creates additional complexity rather than resolves some of it. But nevertheless, we need these types because there are certain classes of problems which do reflect the idea that time is a moment as opposed to an interval. So we've got date and we've got time, naive date time, date time, date range, no time range though, so we're not very orthogonal in the way that everything comes together. This is clearly not a unified theory of time in the Elixir world, or I would argue, at least in all the programming languages I know, the same issue. And it means that from a programming point of view, we have to write a lot of functions, and I certainly find myself doing this going, is the input parameter one of these four types? If so, what was the intended consequence of combining these into something which then needs to become an output type? The hell, what the hell would that mean? Anyway, I swear I did not touch the button. <laughs> so the first objective in the implementation of a library that I'm calling Tempo because you pick something Latin or Greek and it sounds really valuable and important, uh, is in the first instance to define a unifying type that allows... So let's see if we can unify a time type. Um, through the journey of trying to build this code, which has made reasonable progress, I don't recommend its use by anybody, but it is on GitHub, it is open and you can do whatever the heck you want if you're really bored one evening and don't have anything else to do. So leveraging the syntax of what ISO 8601 brings, but the concept of time as an interval, we can start to think about, can we unify the time types and no longer have to have date, time, naive date, time, date, time, date, dot range, time, dot range? And the answer is a tentative yes, i.e. I haven't done enough work yet to find out if this fails at some important point which is usually the point at which someone puts their hand up and says, I tried this five years ago and there's a fatal flaw in your reasoning. If you could hold that question to the end and after everyone's <laughs> left, I'd, I'd, really, I'd really appreciate that. Just, you know, just to come a long way uh, for this presentation. So uh, bear with me for a moment uh, just to explain what's going on here because code examples all look like this. First thing you'll notice is there's a single O. I just invented that because all the good letters are taken. O wasn't really very popular, so I just picked O for tempo. Uh, the syntax inside that looks on this page identical to the syntax for how you would define uh, dates and times using 8601 syntax in the Elixir standard types with the from .iso 8601 that you would see today. If that's what you're seeing, that's good. That's what I intended. That's what it shows here. What this also shows here is, and, and the underlying of this is one simple function. It's just tempo.from iso 8601. So there's no polymorphic magic going on. There is actually just a single type, one struct, and, and uh, a list of data elements, which allow us to define dates and times of arbitrary resolution. So I'm going to use the term resolution a bit through this. Resolution is a way of expressing, if we said 2022, we would say the resolution of that time is one year. And if I said August 31st, 2022, I'd say the resolution is one day, and the rest I'm sure you can fill in in the middle. There are some additional capabilities later on we'll talk about when we get to groups and select that give us different ways to group time resolution, but that's kind of the underlying principle here. And you can see that we can have reduced resolution time. So the uh, SIGL 0 2022, perfectly valid. What do we know about that? We know it's got the resolution of one year. Uh, we'll also see that because it starts with a year, we also know that it can actually be placed on the timeline. We also start to take advantage now of the fact that not all calendars are year, month, and day. Some calendars are year, week, and day of week. And there are a lot of other calendars in the world. Uh, I discovered when I started writing calendar software, I don't recommend anyone goes down that rabbit hole. That's going to take years away from you. That's what it did to me. No need for you to repeat that. 
so we've been able to unify time. Bear with me for a moment to prove that. But it doesn't solve all of our problems because now we're at August the 31st. Where on earth does August 31st fit on the universal timeline? It, it doesn't. It fits in multiple places because August the 31st is a concept we're all comfortable with. Oh, today's August the 31st. Now, you could say that implies 2022, but not all problems are solved by the implication of what the lower resolution time units might be that are assumed to be on the front here. So we've got a class of problems that need to be solved by representing incomplete dates and times. Now, I've used date components, year, month, day, week, year, weekday, quite a lot. Please just assume that means equally available to use for the time components. They are not second-class citizens. I love the resolution of hours, months and sec uh, hours minutes and seconds. Uh, it, I just happen to have focused more on dates, but it's equally applicable. There is no distinction whatsoever. So we use years, we use decades, we use centuries. Ah, between the, in the 20th century, so-and-so, in the 16th century. We can't model those in the existing time types, but we can model those if we take a slightly different approach to thinking about the representation of time. So the first step is to consider this idea of time being either anchored or not anchored. And if you've got a better term for this, then I'd love to hear it because I've spent far too much time worrying about what to call it. So an anchored time is one which can be placed upon the timeline, therefore starts with a year because that's how we start to offset in the timeline. And a floating date or time is one which is not yet anchored on the timeline. Yep, okay, that's logically consistent, so we can move forward an additional step. So this idea of being anchored or not anchored is very helpful when we start to think further about composition and enumeration, which are pretty valuable concepts, I think, for date and time that are not yet fully expressed. So when the idea of time is primarily about ordering or sequency, which is primarily what the date and time types in Elixir and other computing languages are used for, then everything is going to be anchored because we can't order or sequence things and guarantee that ordering or sequencing unless they're anchored on the timeline. It's only when we start to disconnect those two ideas we can get to a more abstract or symbolic way of looking at time. Perfectly acceptable in, in, in tempo, perfectly acceptable in the syntax of ISO 8601, completely ISO standard at this point. This should give you confidence it's a good thing except for those cases where ISO is not a good thing. So here we have a time which is the eighth month, 8M. This is using the explicit 8601 syntax, which is what I mostly use since it's explicit, and explicit is good. Uh, we have uh, eighth month, 31st day. That could be today. This is one of the many instances of month 8, day 31. So it can't be claimed that this is the representation of today but it is the representation which includes today and many other August 31sts. And we can do the same thing with time, the third hour or the 39th minute and the 24th second. So now we've got a unified type which allows us to have anchored time and floating time, i.e. we can express time as a set of time units irrespective of whether they start or end with year and second and pick any sequence in the middle that reflects what it is you're trying to express. And that simplifies things quite a lot. But it doesn't solve everything because, ah, leap years. Variable month lengths, variable numbers of months in a year. Variable numbers of months in a year based upon the year and other things. It's complicated when it comes to the world of calendaring. And the proleptic Gregorian calendar isn't even by far the most complex, but it is probably the most relevant. So we'll just stick with that uh, for the majority of the rest of this presentation. And we don't have today in the existing time types a way of expressing the idea of variable length time units. So we probably want to do something about that. And I'm just going to take a short digression because I just find this fascinating. You may find it completely boring. So if, if that's the case, catch up on your snooze and I'll get back to you uh, pretty quickly. And I think at the root of all of the challenges we have with time representation in computing, it's this that creates the complexity, the complexity, because it makes time very unapproachable. And I suspect we separated the idea of dates and time, i.e. time of day, as it really should be called, primarily because in time of day, hours, minutes, and seconds, 
There is at least today a uniform understanding of how long a day is in the term of hours and how long an hour is in terms of minutes and how long seconds in terms of minutes as well. Well, it wasn't actually always that way. The 24 hours comes from, it's either the Egyptians, the Greeks or the Romans, so we'll go with the Egyptians for this one, who counted the daylight hours uh, as 10, 10 daylight hours, which is easy to do because of fingers and thumbs of the traditional hands. And then they added an hour at the beginning of the day for that ambiguous period of sunrise and similarly for the ambiguous period at sunset and said, okay, and now we need to have 12 for the, day, for the dark hours as well. Now, they could never have used my proposal here because the period of an hour for the Egyptians at that time and for many other cultures was actually variable. It was take the available hours of, sunrise, of, of sunlight and divide by 10. And since the number of hours of sunlight are different, it's only a fairly recent invention, the idea of standardizing how long is an, an hour. Um, minutes come from the Greek, uh, from the same root as minutia, so the small part of an hour. And seconds just mean the second smallest part of an hour. And there used to be thirds and fourths. And if you like sexagesimal arithmetic, i.e. base 60, You'd, you'd under, you'd, you start to understand why this was powerful, not just because of the common factors of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, and 12, if I got that more or less right, but because if you hold your hand up, if any hand's fine, uh, and you use your thumb, you'll notice you've got 12 segments of finger you can point at and count like an abacus. And therefore, 12 becomes an incredibly useful number. And therefore, 12 hours in a day, hours in a night, 24 hours for the whole circle of that, and it becomes fairly easy to start calculating then minutes and seconds. And days are just a really complicated way that every culture on Earth has tried to align the orbit of the moon of the Earth and the orbit of the Earth of the sun and try and come to some agreement about what that actually means as the passage of time. And all of that you knew, that was just a fun history lesson for me. But it gets to the point where we say, well, hold on, we're being inconsistent. If I look at a typical innumerable and I slice it, I can slice with negative offsets, because in this case they're offsets, not indexes. And we can't do that with dates and times. I can't create date.new 2022 8 minus 1. So maybe we can fix that problem, because if we do that, I can start to refer to the interval of a month and the interval of a day and the interval of a year without actually having to know how long any of those are. So, the, I haven't got time for that. So, <laughs> uh, so we can do that. And so the Tempo takes an approach, again, it turns out syntactically 8601 already includes this capability, uh, to be able to express any time unit with either a positive or a negative number, and you can actually express the last one as a floating point number and have that resolve to the downstream units as well. So now we can start to refer to time units with negative offsets. I never have to know about how long a month is in days and how, how long a year is in months. Th those are the two complicated ones. So that's a positive step forward. I hope that you would agree. So now we've got a single time type. We've got a time type that can abstract away the concerns of knowing how complicated a calendar is. Now we want to be able to do something useful. Now, there are lots of things we should be able to do. Some, so some dates and times, calculate intervals, do lots of things. That's all coming, not here yet, but enumeration and composition are. Because we can't really compose the Elixir standard date time types today. We can't say, take, take the date and take the time and combine them. I, I can do date time dot new, which will merge them. But if I've created a day here, 31, day 31, day 31, that's totally valid. Now, of course, it doesn't mean much to me. It's not linked to anything. It's not in reference to anything. I can do the same thing for eighth month and the same thing for year 2022. And then I can merge those together. I can compose them and come up with a time which is now more placeable on the timeline. And I can see whether it's anchored and I can determine what the resolution is for any of those. So if we've got composition, now we can go to enumeration. And it turns out that I've misled you 
quite egregiously, and you can take me to task on this later, time is in fact not an interval, but is better expressed as a set of intervals. And sets of intervals happen to model a lot of really important things in how we manage lives and business. Think of free busy scheduling, meeting alignment, when can we all get together, is nothing more really than set intersections and set operations on a set of intervals. And so the ultimate goal now becomes for Tempo to come to the point where we can represent an arbitrary uh, reference set of time intervals that we can then use set operations on. At the moment, we've got sets. So I've just been talking about 2022, the year. In parenthesis here, set elements. And set elements start you thinking, now I know how to enumerate. OK, good. And we can extend this arbitrarily to multiple combined time units. So the second example says the years 2020 and 2022 Within those, the months 3, 6, 9, and 12. Or an even more complicated one where we add on, and by the way, using a range, all of the days from one to the last one, whatever the last one is. So now we're able to represent an enumerable type that is unifying all of our time pieces. And it actually works surprisingly well, according to the user population of one. <laughs> And at least as of 3 o'clock this morning, this was working. So there's a fairly good chance it'll still be working right now. Fairly good chance. So it's, uh, it's enum. We can do all the good, cool enum things with it. I can count how many years are in my enumeration here. Uh, you can see the other examples. Uh, but when we get to the sets can also be ranges, it means that we can enumerate a little bit like a comprehension. We've got multiple time elements that each have their own sets of values, and the enumeration will enumerate each of these as a comprehension. So it will give you a Cartesian product of all of those sets in, that, in the right order. So order is guaranteed, and you know that you're going to get them in the sequence of left to right based upon the time units. And although you would never use it for this purpose, it is kind of fun to be able to use an enumeration to count how many days there are in a year by expressing the year as the year, the number of months in a year, and the number of days in a month, and recognizing that number of months is variable depending on the calendar, the number of days in a month is variable depending on the month, which depends upon the year, and the math all still comes out, at least for these two examples, <laughs> which, which, passes the, which passes the conference test. And you can do some other things here, because sometimes we want to increase the resolution of what we're talking about. Uh, let's meet in 2022. Not that helpful from a scheduling point of view, need a little more information. So we can zoom into this and recognizing again that we're still talking about intervals or sets of intervals. Zooming is the idea of increasing resolution without changing the interval. So if a year is, let's say 365 days as a, as a standard year, then whatever I do to zoom in, to increase resolution, can't reduce that span. That's the concept of zoom. Not happy with that function name either. Um, quite happy to take nominations. And you can see that you can zoom all the way down to seconds. I haven't gone to milliseconds uh, or microseconds or nanoseconds. It's a trivial extension to make. Just haven't bothered uh, to do so yet. The reason that thirds and fourths didn't take off for, uh, for Sumerians was that no one could measure time at that resolution, and if they could, no one would turn up on time at that resolution. So what's the point anyway for human-based time engagements? Now, all of those are explicit enumerations, but there's also the idea of implicit enumerations, and implicit enumerations is my interpretation of what human beings expect, which means Jose would probably tell me this is a really bad idea because it's hiding complexity or it's too much magic, but it just feels really comfortable to me. Feedback always welcome. And so the idea here is that for any time expression, any tempo time type, you can enumerate it. You don't have to do anything. You can enumerate it because it will say, OK, you haven't otherwise specified what to enumerate. I'll assume you're going to enumerate at the next Zoom level. So a year will, it will enumerate at months, months, at days, and so on. And you can also do it if the calendar happens to be week-based. It'll enumerate weeks and then days of week as opposed to months and days. And you can see the example here. 
Uh, and it supports any calendar, so uh, I have a, an ISO week calendar for people that do that. I have a National Retail Federation calendar. I have a bunch of really weird configurable calendars uh, that let you enumerate all over them. This one will enumerate the 52 weeks of the current ISO week calendar, uh, if that's helpful. Uh, and then enumerating a calendar itself, the notional calendar you put up on the wall or that you use in Outlook or Thunderbird or some other, other system, actually becomes incredibly trivial. It's just now one nested enumeration. I enumerate the year, and for each element of the year, I enumerate the day, because that's the next level down if it's a month, and I get a nested list of days in order within months in order. And at that really simple level, you can make that even simpler. You just enum the, the year, and then just enum the list, the thing that you get, which is going to result in the days. I don't think there's an easier way to express how to build a calendar for an arbitrary calendar that complies with all the calendar rules and still delivers you the right stuff. And I don't know about you, but I've spent too much time in my life trying to work out how to do this in a manner that doesn't just kill my brain every time. So although I don't say this solves all the problems of the universe, it solves one problem really quite nicely. And the conversion at this case between the elixir standard types and the tempo types really straightforward. I haven't done much of that work, but uh, the implementation underneath in tempo is a keyword list because order is important and it's a map in Elixir and I just got to do some stuff uh, to, to do that. And it turns out there's some other things that are helpful. If you're doing job scheduling and you say, I want to send emails to all of my customers at midnight, and that creates a noticeable bump in compute load. And it's actually not that important whether you send it at midnight or one minute past midnight or one minute before midnight. So you can even use this concept to say, I'm going to send all my emails at midnight, ish, ish. <laughs> so just use enum random on, on midnight, and you'll get something, which is a date time value that you can use, which has its own uh, interesting side effects, I think. So objective six, uh, full support of ISO 8601. A very, all of the practical people in the audience would say that is a non-goal irrelevant, I don't really care, but I'm not wired that way. I don't write software for a living and I have really bad habits. And one of those habits is I need to be in a position to say job done and complete. There's probably a clinical term for that, but I prefer you didn't use it because it's probably going to hurt my head even more. Uh, but it turns out that if you spend enough money with ISO and buy parts one and parts two of ISO 8601, you get 123 pages of fun. <laughs> Your definition of fun may vary, but I have to say to you that the, the content is mind-bending, the, the lack of a formal grammar is challenging, the fact that there's no compliance suite is difficult, uh, and that's just the way I, it turns out I like it, uh, which I'm almost ashamed to admit. Um, but it is interesting that I could not find a single implementation of ISO 8601 in any computing language anywhere in the Googleverse that encompasses anything that's in part two, because there are kind of early drafts of part one on the internet you can find publicly, but the, because this is all copyrighted, I had to fork out real money, or, or euros anyway, uh, to, to get uh, hold of the, the content. So when I write the documentation for this, it may be the only documentation in the public domain that would help people understand what the hell is going on. So I set myself six objectives. Uh, you're in the position to decide whether I met any of them, but the first was to, to, to recognize the idea that time is better suited as an interval than a moment, unified into a single time type that can be anchored on the timeline or not. It's okay not to be anchored. From that, we shouldn't have to know about calendars, so having negative offsets lets us abstract that away, and now we can start to enumerate and compose. There is a wonderful concept called Allen's Integral Algebra. Uh, interval algebra, apologies, uh, which, which speaks to the idea of how you compare intervals to each other. There are 13 different results you can get from comparing two intervals. That's coming up very soon uh, and is, is really a lot of fun. And then the, the really super cool stuff is when I get to, to set and intersections because then scheduling becomes completely trivial. Just take the free busy uh, set of intervals from every participant and intersect them. Job done, thanks for coming, have a nice day. And anyone in this room that's tried to work on scheduling knows that's a difficult problem. 
Uh, please don't expect PRs for that for next week. It's going to take a little bit uh, longer. And lastly, the parser will implement... Well, there's two clauses left that the parser doesn't implement for 8601, parts 1 and parts 2. So if you've got a need to parse arbitrary ISO 8601 formatted data, you can do that today. I need to do a bit of refactoring because it takes a long time to compile with Nimble Parsec because it's quite a deep... Uh, it's quite a deep grammar, and I have to refactor it uh, to reduce compile time performance a little bit. I think it's like, on this is an M1 Max, I think it takes about 40 seconds. So you probably don't want to do that all the time. I'll, I'll fix uh, that, and, uh, and then we'll be done. So uh, I showed you a picture at the beginning. I need to uh, finish at the end, because I said that I would do my best to maintain my aspirational scope of the full length of the universe. So it turns out in ISO 8601 plus one small extension I added to the grammar solely so that I could actually put this on this slide. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and more egregious crimes have been committed. Uh, this is basically saying that uh, since the universe is, by the most contemporary theory, under challenge from the plasma theorists, but if we accept the Big Bang theory, uh, big, the universe began 13.787 billion years ago with a margin of error of 20 million years. So if we don't really worry about epochs and where the Gregorian calendar fits. The offset, the uh, margin of error tends to hide that. Uh, we don't know when it ends, so inter um, yeah, intervals and durations in ISO 8601 are separated by a solidus, the forward slash, and two dots says undefined. And the R at the front says that this is repeating because most people seem to think, or at least smart people seem to think, that the universe, uh, when it gets to the big crunch, will probably have another big bang. So the definition of time, the universe, and everything actually can be described by ISO 8601, and I hope at some point you might have just as much fun of uh, doing things with this as uh, I have, hopefully on time. <laughs>